Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and open your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Amen. Does anybody know if this is fresh water? Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure. Amoeba free is for me. Oh, out of the pond, out of the retention pond. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, uh, we find Jesus being baptized in water by John the Baptist. Actually, the end of the, end of the third chapter, moving into the fourth. And um, at that time, the Holy Spirit descended on him and anointed him. Luke goes on to tell us that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness where he faced temptations the t same temptations that man faced, and overcoming them, of course, by the power of the Spirit through the Word of God. After the wilderness experience, Jesus returned, not full of the Spirit, but in the power of the Spirit. Let's look at the 16th verse. And he came to Nazareth, where he, and this is what happens. Now remember, let's, verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught them in our synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, <clears throat> you know, it's good to have a custom to go to church. I said, it's good to have a custom to go to church. Now, if Jesus had a custom of going to church, I think all of us people in the body of Christ ought to have a custom of going to church. Instead of finding some little doctor that tells you, I don't have to go to church. Well, a lot of people just go because it's their custom. Well, Jesus did it. Amen. And if it's good enough for the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. it's good enough for me. Amen. Amen. If it's good enough for the head of the church, it's good enough for me. Amen. I don't have to go to church. Well, Jesus did. Y'all here? Y'all going home? Uh, he was under the law. Thank you for that information I didn't have. I'm messing. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered on him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. See, now Jesus had a ministry, and he built his ministry on this text. Amen. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, or better translated, the year of Jubilee. And he closed the book, gave it to the minister, and sat down. And all the eyes of all them in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture... Fulfilled in your ears. And they bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph? And I'll tell you, that's where they got in trouble. They got their eyes off the, off the, off the anointing got it on the man. <clears throat> you know, we look at people, we, we get, we get, we're consumed in this era with the, the appearance of men. More so than we are if they're anointed or not. If they, if they got a cool look, if they got a cool this, if they got a cool that, we, we get enambered with them. Right. Well, they must be right because they got all the high-tech stuff. Right. That makes them right. That just means they got money. Yeah. Right. I said that means they just got money. Amen. Don't mean they're anointed. Right. Hello? You, have you not figured out by now that man can make man famous? Now, I'm just going to use this as an example, but how many have ever seen the show Ellen? It's about her fourth show. All of us got canceled, you know? Nobody would watch it. But Hollywood has an agenda to make her succeed. So they just keep putting her out there and keep putting her out there and keep putting her out there. Don't matter if she loses money or not, they want her out there. 
Hello? And so everybody, and then, so now she, she's hosting the Grammys or whatever because they want her out there. Not Grammys, uh, uh, the Emmys, you know, the Oscars, the Oscars. They want her out there. They want to keep, they keep putting her out there because they've got an agenda. With the right amount of money and the right technology, you can make somebody somewhat famous or whatever. We've got a whole network on there that loses money every month with their news people. Their news people get erased in the ratings every week, every day. And they keep putting them out there because there's an agenda. So what I'm saying is, when we come to the body of Christ, see, that same, that same mindset gets over into the church. And because we want to make somebody famous, that you know, let's, let's face it, a Christian television network can make or break a ministry today. They can make you famous overnight. All they got to do is bring you in on the, big, on, on the big network talk show, have you on there a few times, tell everybody how great you are, and the next thing, everybody in the world wants to have you in their church, and everybody in the world wants to have you come and you know, they want to buy your books and your tapes. It's, it's, so it, it can be marketed, but it doesn't make it right. See, the church has got to be more spiritually discerning. Well, that's just a stupid statement. Well, of course we are supposed to be more spiritually discerning than the world. Let me try to rephrase that. The church does not need to adopt the world's method of judging things. We judge it as successful because it's big. Hello? I forgot. Maybe it was Amazon or somebody makes no money. They sell all the stuff that you get cheap. All the employees get paid. They don't, really don't make any money. Well, does that make it successful? Well, if you're a stockholder, No. You're not getting any dividends? No. Now, I could be wrong, but I believe, I believe it was Amazon they were talking about that did that. It is Amazon. Okay. They make no money because they're, they're, they're doing everything so cheap. That's why you get it so cheap. Yeah, we love it, don't we? Yeah, until Walmart goes out of business or all the mom and pops go out of business or everybody else. Goes. Look, I, and I'm bad about it, too. I'll get on there like, I went to the dealership the other day. One of our, our little fobs, those, those, those keys, the big fat keys you stick in your ignition and all that stuff. Well, we got one's bad. It hadn't really worked right since we bought the van. And, and I was at the dealership getting the oil changed. And I said, how much is, is uh, it to replace one of these? He said, well, it, it costs between $230 and $250 plus an hour's labor to program it. You're crazy. They bought that in China for about $2.95. And you will charge me $250? That's what they charge? I got on the internet. Guess what? I found one brand new. I'm going to take it and get a program. 30 bucks. Looks just like it. Looks just like it. 30 bucks. Huh? It's prettier. That's right, because it's newer. So I'm going to find me a locksmith that, that programs. And I have a program. He'll probably do it for half the price of the dealership would. Amen. Why did I say that? I don't know. Oh, Amazon. Yeah, because I use it. I ain't paying two hundred fifty dollars for that little piece of plastic. So you're crazy. So it didn't work right, and then you go you go charge me two hundred fifty bucks for that. Internet, Amazon. So anyway, that was all to say that Amazon didn't make any money. But we judge them successful because they're big. We we judge ministry successful because they're big. We judge ministry successful because they write books. Anybody with a computer can write a book down and have it published. They've got software now where you can upload your, your book to their computers, to their systems, and people can buy them on demand, and they are printed on demand. You don't have to pre-buy anything. Just upload it. What's that? Lulu.com. Send your book up there, they, and then somebody orders it. It's printed right then and mailed to them. So anybody can get a book. <clears throat> and there's a lot of books out there somebody should have never wrote. There's a whole lot of books out there. You go to a Christian bookstore and you can come out of schizophrenic. Because you got this book over here, Jesus wants everybody well. You got this book over here, God made everybody sick. Hello? You got this book over here, everybody, everybody's eternally secure. This book over here, everybody's going to hell. Hello? So what am I saying? There is something that we need to be more aware of in the body of Christ than what we've been aware of in the past decade or so. There have been seasons we were, but we've become lethargic. We've been caught up with self. We've been caught up with materialism. It's all about me. 
We wrote, we wrote, we wrote songs. It's, uh, it's all about Jesus. It's all about me. And we're no longer judging things by the anointing. Now, a few years ago, we had a, we had a minister in here. He was from uh, Africa. Um, he was from, I think it was from Namibia. Namibia. It used to be Southwest Africa. And uh, he was an African minister. He had come to America. He had been with us one time before, and he called me and wanted to come back, and we were in a place where he was close enough. He said, I said, well, come on, he came and ministered. And we, we went out and had lunch that day when he got into town. He said, you know, I was up at the camp meeting up here in, in, in Virginia. He said, and, and, and then two nights ago, they had this woman from Brazil, who's dead now, by the way, who caused the gold dust to appear. Now, the building held about 3,000 people. That was their, that's the, the, this camp meeting they, they set up. They had about 3,000 people there. And she was doing her gold dust thing. And everybody was throwing money in the offerings. He said what she ministered was, was basically terrible. Just wasn't good. But she had this, that, see, she was gimmicky to people. They found out later it was all a gimmick. And it, you know, listen, I tell you, a lot of these things are. A lot of these things are gimmicks. And see, that messes up when God really does do things supernaturally. When the gimmick people get out there, everybody's a little leery of it. He said the next night a young man got up, a young minister got up, preached the best sermon he heard all week, and 80 people were there. He said if they had stayed for his church service, they would have gotten blessed. They would have gotten something that could have changed their life. Gold dust on your Bible doesn't change your life. Hello? You know, a little flake or two here. Ooh, look, they appeared on my Bible. It's just like the woman used to have the feathers and the oil come on her. Got slow motion cameras. I found out she had, she had things making it happen. Milk the church out of thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. Because we get, we get caught up. But notice what Jesus said. The anointing came on him. And if you really think about this, not one thing did he say about the anointing coming on him to make people all, all over him. He said the anointing came on to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the year of Jubilee. Notice he didn't say one thing about it making him something else. We've got to start judging once more by the anointing. Are they anointed? Is there an anointing there that does these things in aiding the believer? Amen. Jesus was anointed to do these things. Just like Janie said this morning, in the case of, of Jairus' daughter, he told them, don't, don't, don't tell anybody about this. He went out and started telling everybody why. <clears throat> he wasn't trying to make his proclamation. And one, one reason was he wasn't ready to be revealed in his fullness yet. And then you get all the, the sensation seekers showing up, and that hurts the anointing. They come for the wrong reason. They don't come hungering and thirsting after righteousness. They come because Elvis is in the building. We treat many of our ministers like a rock star. The traveling ministries with the big television ministries, and it's, it's, not, it's not always their fault. It's the entrapment. But many begin to be treated like rock stars. And to be worshipped by people. And it's wrong for the people to do that. Now, I'm going to say something. That you need to have good ministries. Now, Dad Hagel is one of them. He always, he always plugged the local church. You need a pastor. You know, he, he, you, know you need a pastor. You need to sit under a pastor. You need to be in a local church giving and doing. You don't need to be flying your jet or you're flying in an airplane every weekend to go pray at so-and-so's meeting as an intercessor and never have a local church. I've met people like that. Well, where do you go to church? Well, I just fly around and I follow brother so-and-so around and I pray at his meetings. Well, who's speaking into your life correction as a pastor? There's not an answer to that one. Okay. So, Jesus said the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. The Holy Ghost coming on people will make people do things. That will help people. Now, just like last week, we said, you know, the, uh, you know a real famous minister in, in, in the world today came to one of the biggest churches in America and said that, if, you know, that, that uh, if any preacher that says that God judges individuals or nations is sick. That was his statement. They're sick. 
Wow, Paul was a sick dude. Hello? Because he turned that guy over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. You know what Paul said? He said, when you get together, I've already judged. He judged an individual. So Paul was sick, according to this guy. God judges an individual or a nation. If you preach that God judges an individual or a nation, you're sick. Well, I got this for you. And, and let, me, let me say this. When people are always saying, God showed me and God told me, and they don't grab a hold of this and show you where God showed them, where God told them, you better watch out. See, the anointing is sent not to glorify a human. The anointing is sent to lift up Jesus, to draw men into Jesus, not draw men into yourself. How do you know you're glorifying the man? Well, what they say takes precedent over what the Word says. Now, y'all remember the story Dad Hagen told? He, was in the, he had the vision, and the de you know, he's talking to the Lord. The demon came out and going, yakety-yak, yakety-yak, yakety-yak. And he couldn't hear. He could see the Lord Jesus. He could see, hear, hear, hear him. He could see him speaking, but he couldn't hear what he was saying. And he, he's sitting there kind of getting frustrated. And finally, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus to shut up and get out of here. And he says, right after the demon ran out, the, the, the Lord turned to him and said, if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't have. Brother Hagin said he went, now, no, Lord, now, I know I misunderstood you. You didn't say you couldn't. You just said you wouldn't have. Written, written, right? He says, no, I said if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't have. And they said, now, brother, now, now, Lord, now, I just know I didn't hear you right. I know you said you wouldn't have done anything that you, you didn't say you couldn't have. He said about the third time he did that, the Lord looked at him with fire in his eyes and said, I said if you hadn't done anything about that, I could not have. Amen. Brother Hagin said he, he said it for a second. He looked at him and said, now, Lord. Now, I mean, don't mean any disrespect, but uh, your, body, your word says you, that you have to, everything, every word spoken has to be proven out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. I'm going to need some Bible for that one. And the Lord said, I'll do you one better. He said, I'll give you four. And he showed him four different passages of Scripture about the authority of the believer and how the, the believer has to exercise his authority. Now, he went out and said, now, the Lord told me this, but then he gave you the Scriptures yeah. to back it up. Yeah. See, anointed people aren't afraid to prove out what they have. If, you're, if it's the anointing, if it's the Holy Ghost on you, doesn't the Bible say the Word and the Spirit agree? Amen? So if it's the anointing, that's the Holy Ghost, then it's going to bear witness to the Word and be in agreement with it. So we need to be more aware. Just look at somebody gets up and says, well, I was just going to the house and the Lord spoke to me and said this. Really? The same person I heard him say, I heard them say this one time. They said they were in the car and the daughter was in the back seat and she did something wrong. And he, said, he turned around and says, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. And the Lord told him, you're not teaching her grace. And so he stopped and went, what would Jesus do? Now, wait a second. The Bible says the rod of correction drives rebellion from the heart of the child. Amen. Amen. He who spares rod hates his child. There, there, is, there is a training and a discipline and let me say something. You don't reason with two-year-olds. They don't cognitively get. What they do get is, if I grab this, my backside hurts. Hello? Are you here? Now, when they get older, you begin to have discussions about reasoning things. Now, the consequences for doing this are this. But still, there still has to be consequences for the wrong. Yeah, the Lord told him, you know, no, never gave any scripture, just the Lord told him. The Lord showed him. We can't build doctrines on the Lord showed me. We have to build doctrines on what the Word says. The Word of God is given for doctrine. All scripture is, all scripture is given, profitable for doctrine. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so, <clears throat> Jesus, when Jesus came, now what, what did he say here? He didn't just get and say, I'm the anointed one. He read scripture. Amen. He even went on to say that you're going to say, um, you will surely say that to be this proverb, a physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we've done in Capernaum, I'll do also in your country. But I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. He goes on and starts quoting more Bible to them 
about what's going to happen. So if you're anointed, you're not afraid of the Bible. As a matter of fact, your Bible's your buddy. Amen? I'm saying this in a precursor to talking about walking in the anointing. If, you are real, if it's truly the anointing, you won't be afraid of the Bible saying don't do this. Or that's wrong. Or that's out of line. Because if you're truly anointed, you want to follow God's plan. God's will do it God's way. Amen. Here's the danger. When you start leaving the Bible alone, only go on the feeling of the anointing. Satan can mask the feeling. Or your flesh can mask the feeling. Or I'm sorry, imitate. Imitate the feeling. And make you think it's the anointing. Oh, God's here. How do you know? Well, we sing it. I got it. I got it. I feel him in my hands. I feel him in my feet. I feel him all over me. But you know what? I don't know I got the Holy Ghost because I got because I feel it. I received the Holy Ghost in them because it, what, what I experienced what the Bible said I would experience. So and they were filled with spoken tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance. I know that because that's, I, the Bible is the Bible for it. Well, how do you know he's here? He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. Amen. I'm the friend six closer than a brother. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know that Jesus is here because I feel him. I know he's here because his word says he's here. Now, it's great when I feel it. But I can't base what I say about his presence because of my feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. Your, fitness, your, fin your feelings are finicky. Y'all remember being in grade school and liking somebody and, they, and, you, and you send them the letter, I like you, do you like me? Check yes, no, or maybe. And they send back, no way, Jose. Now you hate them. I hate you. Why? Because feelings are finicky. <clears throat> you can wake up this morning and not feel anointed. Doesn't mean you're not anointed. I tell you some of the biggest miracles we've had with prayer calls is when I didn't feel a thing. But it doesn't matter. See, the anointing is not based on your feelings. Oh, we like it. Everybody in this room likes the anointing. I love the feeling of it. I love the feeling of the manifestation of the Spirit. You know, I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Well, just even if I don't hear the brush of angels' wings, the Holy Spirit's in this place. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory. glory. Isaiah said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good, th good tidings unto the meek, sent me to bind up the broken heart and to proclaim, proclaim, <laughs> proclaim, proclaim, Liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of our God and the day of vengeance of our God to come for all the morning. Now, he did not go to the, the day of vengeance of our God because that's not yet. That's coming. But during, during the time when Jesus preached that, that day coming, Jesus stopped there because it wasn't time for that yet. It wasn't time for the day of vengeance. There's a day coming. And I'm not sick to say it. Hello, I'm staying with the Bible. Amen. All right. So, to be anointed, God wants you anointed. Now, we know we're anointed when we're walking in line with the Word and we get the Word's results. Amen. So, we're going to preach the Word. Isn't that right? I mean, we have in the Bible all kinds of things. Judges 3.10, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and went out to war and the Lord delivered Kushan Rishathim, the Rishathim, King of Mesopotamia into his hand, and his hand prevailed against him. See, the Spirit of God will come on you, and he'll cause you to walk in freedom and deliverance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank God for the anointing. Amen. Thank God that when we're in trouble, his hand can come on us. Amen. Now, understand this. Uh, Brother Hagin did a series a number of years ago. <clears throat> and I have the series uh, called The Spirit Within and The Spirit Upon. See, we all have the anointing of the, when you get born again, you have the witness of the Spirit. When you get baptized, you get the infilling of the Spirit. But then you can have the anointing come on you at special seasons or times for special projects. Just special things. Now, I've had anointing come on me sometimes. And, and at times past, I've never had it come like that again. 
Now, you wish you could. Wish you could go back and get that again. But see, God's not going to let you get lifted up in pride. And one of the worst things you can ever do is start taking the credit unto yourself. Man, I'm, man, I got six people healed last night. Boy, you want an early death? It won't you. It was the Lord. It was his anointing. We minister to the sick. And we say this, you know, our, our ministry has a special anointing. But it's not us. It's still not me. When we lay hands on claws of sin, man, it's not Ed Taylor. It's the, it's the anointing. It's the anointing that's transferred. You don't take, me, you don't take my DNA out there. Hello, they might not want to be Dutch Irish. Our idea of a suntan is freckles running together. My dad, my dad's redheaded, and he never got tanned in the summer. His freckles would just run together. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Look at Samson, verse Judges 14, 6, and the Spirit came upon, upon him, mightily upon him, and he rent, as he, as, as he would rent a kid, he had nothing in his hand, and he told down his father, mother what he had done. He didn't tell them all the stuff he did. Lion came out, and just ripped him out. Bear came out, and just ripped him up. I mean, he's just, Philistines come out, and he just eat them up. Until he got lifted up in pride. And what got him lifted up in pride? Well, he don't a woman. Mother Hagen said, watch out for the three G's, the gold, the glory, and the girls. The gold, the glory, of the girls to get you in trouble. You start using it for money, and you get enamored about money with your ministry, it gets you in trouble. You get thinking about how great you are and start, you know, just, I mean, you're all about you, and you start mocking every ministry in the world because you're so cool. They don't wear skinny jeans like you. I, you don't want to see me in skinny jeans. <laughs> Hello. And I know this. I got some natural bed head I can rock, but I just don't come out in public like that. You can ask the kids. Some people pay money to get bed head like mine. Why people do their, I, I just don't get it, you know. They can put stuff in their head to make it look like they just got out of bed. I just don't get it. Because when I get out and see that, I look at the mirror and see that, I do everything I can to get rid of it right then. Stick, it, stick your head under the water and wet it down and comb it out. Because, I mean, it's, it's part of here, and it's going up there, and it's coming up here. And it's... I mean, I'm rocking it, man. But you start thinking you're really somebody, you're really great, that's the glory. And let me say something. One of the biggest traps of any ministry is the girls. You've got to watch out for, with, for, for relationships with women. With women. You've got to guard yourself. You've got to guard your heart. And you got to put protections around you. Why? Because the devil will use that to bring you down. The gold, the glory, or the girls. Either one, any one of them gets you in trouble. And here's the problem. Usually if you get in trouble in one area, you end up in trouble in all three. So we have to recognize we say humble before the Lord. And whatever anointing is on our life, whatever anointing he places upon us, we use it for his glory. We use it to advance his kingdom. And we honor the handmaidens of the Lord. We don't try to use it for ourselves. That went over real big. Thank you. Well, Sam, remember Samson got in trouble because he got the, Delilah came down and started. She seduced him. She didn't think he was a hunk. She went in, well, first chance she got, she she stabbed, stabbed him in the back. He, he and he knew it. He kept lying to her, and he kept falling for her stuff. And finally, she, she put the, if you really love me. She threw the little, if you really love me thing on him. Oh, well, baby, I love you. Uh, it's my hair. She got him drunk, cut all his hair off, and then the Philistines are upon thee, and there it was. Guess who went around when he was walking around the grist mill? <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. He said, sloot, not sloth. All right. She wasn't there. Hello? We have, to guard, we have to guard the anointings in our life by staying humble, by staying pure, by keeping our eye on the Lord, by keeping our, keeping our hearts to, true to the word, and making sure, let me say this, making sure what we say under the guise of the anointing magnifies the word. Rarely can, you, can the Lord give you something and you can go out and preach it tomorrow. You need to study out and prove it out. And that's one thing you're speaking about, that sudden divine inspiration, that's prophecy. Amen? 
I said, that's prophecy. That's different. That comes by the Holy Spirit. But even that, you, know, you still got to go study the Bible. You got to be a Berean. You got to go prove it out with the Word. So you got to prove it out with the Word. Y'all hear you going home. Which brings us to prophecy. 2 Samuel 23, 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. 2 Chronicles 20, 14. Then upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mathen, the Levi, the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation, and he said, Go out. Now, what, listen, what, what, what was prophesied to Jehoshaphat? was you're going to go out tomorrow against the enemy. The Lord's going to deliver you. You're going to send the singers out first. They're going to sing praise you, the Lord, and pray, praise God for the spirit of holiness. They're going to go out and worship the Lord before you, and God is going to take care of it. That, that's, that lines up with the promise of deliverance and protection yeah. that God gave Israel. Amen. Amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. That prophecy came in line with what the Word already said. Ezekiel 11, 15, 11, 5, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your midst, every one of them. God just giving them a reminder. He's, he's omniscient. He knows everything. I am leery of prophecy that can't be judged by the word. And I'm totally leery of prophecy that you won't let somebody judge. If, if someone speak, let it be about two or three at the most, and let the others judge. Well, I got to work for somebody. I got to give it to them right then. Oh, no. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. If, it's gotta be, if you got to give it to them in secret, you don't need to give it to them. Well, who do you need to give it? Call me up. If it's the Holy Ghost, he can wait till you get over here with me. Let, let somebody judge it. Oh, no, we were in church service, we all, and we just, we got together, and we all, we just prophesied each other. We just prophesied each other. I've been in those meetings. I said, I've been in those meetings. I was a squirrel. I took part in those meetings. Well, I was young and dumb. <clears throat> you don't see them coming to pass. What you do see is people get messed up. Because people start going out because they're young and dumb. You got young and dumb prophesying to young and dumb. What's that? Young squared plus dumb squared. What do you get? Disaster squared. Hello? Now, if it's the Holy Ghost, it can be judged. Matter of fact, it's a biblical principle for it to be judged. When Agabus came down and, ban and bound Paul's hands, did he do it in private or in front of everybody? In front of everybody. Philip had four daughters, or three daughters, I forgot, four? Four daughters, came down and they prophesied in the midst of everybody. You look through the Bible and you see these things taking place in public. Amen. Paul told Timothy to fight a good warfare with the prophecies that had gone before him. But you remember that he had laid hands on him by the presbytery. Things were spoken over him publicly, judged. We need to get back to recognizing that the anointing of God is not weird. Now, it may not be normal to the world, but it's not weird. <clears throat> we should be able to go to the Bible and say, well, this is what this is. And what I just said by the Spirit of God, it lines up with these scriptures. So we're not just kind of rattling off, you know, yay, you will marry me, you gorgeous thing, you. Thus saith the Lord, my daughter, soon to be my servant's wife. I got a three-letter word for you. Run! We need to understand that the anointing of God works in conjunction with the Word of God, and it brings glory to the church, brings glory to the head of the church. The Lord Jesus Christ honors God, and it also helps people. It doesn't confuse them and mix them up. It helps them. 
I was in a meeting one time and said, everybody just turn around and find somebody and lay a hand on and prophesy over them. I walked out. Number one, and that, everybody doing that? No, nobody could judge anything. Hello. I was remember, I was, I was talking with someone recently. I remember the thing that happened, happened in our church a number of years ago. This guy was in the church, and he'd be, he'd be normal for one week, and he'd be squirrel the next. He'd walk into the back of the church with a staff with sandals on during the middle of the week. And pounded on the floor because the pastor's office was up front, kind of like in a room like this at that time. And he say, "So and so, so and so, I have been sent by the Spirit of God. You're not. You're right. Your relationship with your wife is wrong. You're this. You're that." What? Yeah. Finally, I tell him, "Don't do that again. Don't ever do that again." And it's not the Holy Ghost. Number one. Two, relationship with my wife's the best it's ever been. Three, all things you said were off. You it wasn't God. But see, he got he got a oof. He got a huma mama mama. Understand that when the anointing is in manifestation, it's there to help. Even judgment's there to help. When God showed Paul what was going on. And he said, I will be with you in the spirit, and I've judged already what to do. Notice what he said. I'm going to turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Even that judgment under, the, under that anointing was sent to save him from destruction in the end if he didn't repent. Hello? So we're going, to, we're going to let the Holy Ghost do the things he does. We're going to, we're going to write, learn to judge him rightly and in line with his word. Can you say amen in line with his word? Hallelujah. And so prophecy does come. But I am telling you, there, if, if it's the Holy Ghost, oh, I, I just got to say it, I just got to say it, I just got to say it. No, you don't. Now, I've told this before, but because it bears, it bears repeating in, in, a, in an example right here, I, we were at Winter Bible Seminar oh, maybe 10 years, 10 years ago, so no longer than that, about 15 years ago. Dad, was, when Dad Hagen was still here, so he's, it's been 10 years. Can you believe it's been 10 years since he went home? It's, it's amazing. This year will be 11. So but in, in the heyday of Winter Bible Seminar, when Dad was ministering, I mean, you'd have, you'd have Kenneth Copeland, you'd have all those guys sitting up on the platform behind him and stuff. And we'd go and stand in line six hours to get a seat. Stand in the rain, stand in the cold, stand in the Tulsa wind. I mean, it'd be 70 today and 29 tomorrow. That's a crazy weather out there. And um, we think it's bad here. You ought to try it out there. And uh, I remember one night, uh, Dad was on the platform. You know, he, he's ministering. And he just kind of leaned over like this on the podium like he would do sometimes. And he would just. And I'm going to tell you something. The word of the Lord came unto me. For Brother Copeland. Now, I'm over in the side section, about like Benny is, but it's on a much bigger scale. About four rows back, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, man, if I make a move for the platform, because Brother Copeland was like four, three, two rows up on, right behind Dad Hagen. In the, but they had a choir loft back then. They'd, they'd done away with it now, but it was, it was there back then. They sat, they sat over a 1,000 people in the choir loft. And um, I see Brother Copeland up there, and the word of the Lord comes unto me for Kenneth Copeland. And I'm telling you, it was all over me. I said, it was all over me. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I grew up Pentecostal. I knew, I knew the, the Holy Ghost in demonstration and manifestation. I knew his presence. I knew the unction. Boy, I'm sitting out there. It's all over me. And I'm sitting there going, now, Lord, you know, if I get up and head for that platform, those red coats are coming after me. And I won't talk about the British. I was talking about the ushers at Raymond Bible Church and their red coats. They're going to take me down. And I sit there and I struggle with that and I struggle with that and I struggle with that. And then Brother Hagen, he's like this. Kenneth, come here. I'm Brother Copeland. He comes up and he starts to minister to him. Exactly what I got sitting over here. I just wasn't the vessel God was going to use to bring it through. So don't tell me that you can't, you can't control what's in you. It was in there. 
I mean, it was, it, it was almost verbatim, but it, was, it ended up not being verbatim, but it ended up being the complete essence of what he told him. You see? And what kind of was going through me the whole time was, you know, this is for Brother Copeland. I know it's for Brother Copeland, but, you know, how am I going to, you know, we should have been bold and stepped out. No, the Lord told me later. He said, now, what I want to do is I wanted to teach you that you were hearing my voice. That when, I, that when I gave that to you and then I turned around and gave it to, to, to Brother Hagen and he gave it to Brother Copeland, you learned that that was my voice speaking to you. He said, I was just teaching you. I was going to minister to him, but I taught, used that opportunity to teach you at the same time. So whatever you're getting is subject to you, you either using it or, or checking that out or making sure it's God wanting you to do that. I've had God tell me things about the circumstances and tell me not the same thing about it. You want to. And you say, why? I said, because they won't listen. Now, I've done that before. Gone ahead and told me, okay, it just turned into a mess. Why? Because they won't go listen. They didn't want to listen to you. Hard-headed. And it caused them destruction and misery down the road, too. Because they wouldn't listen. Hello? People need to listen. But God tells you some things, some things ahead of time, not to give it to people. So you're, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. What God gives you is still subject to your using it or not, or make sure God wants you to. So if you get something for uh, Karen gets a word for Janice, you know, it's the Holy Ghost, then you can, it, it'll still be there when you show up and get passed around. Amen. Amen. Yeah, but I, I, I feel it right there. Well, you don't give something because you feel it. You get something because God told you to. Amen. 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 It's all right to be judged. What about, you know, or have an elder in the church? Judge it. Somebody that's older in the Lord. Somebody has been, been trained. Somebody that, you know, that can stand there and go, yeah, that's, that's not, you know, sister, I'll be honest with you, I just don't, I don't see that being God. Well, I'll look bad. Yeah, it's better for you to look bad than for them to go and do, follow what you said and not be God. The Lord showed me you're supposed to go to Malaysia tomorrow and win the Muslims. And they ship his head back in a bag. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. But if you did it because I told you to, God has to tell Jerry he's supposed to go to Malaysia. Not Pastor Ed. The prophecy comes to edify us, to build us up, to strengthen us. And in most cases, it does not come through people, your peers, for direction. Yea, thou shalt quit that job, and God will show you what to do next week. Okay, fine. Thank you for the word. Now, are you going to pay my bills in between? Because I'm sure if I'm supposed to quit my job, the Lord showed you I'm supposed to quit my job. He shows you how I'm supposed to make a living during the day, have money that time. That the Lord told them to tell you that. It's one thing if God tells Benny to quit his job. And then you know, he'll, he'll tell him, what, now he's, what's, that, what's that for Benny? If God tells you to quit your job, it's a faith project for you now. He's got faith because he knows the Lord spoke to him. He may not have faith if you tell him the Lord spoke to you for him. Come on. See, we, we, we think because we, we, you know, we feel like we're Balto and with his goose friend, he gets people bumps. They have people bumps. Remember how many of saw Balto the, with the goose, the Russian goose, the Ruski goose? He gets people bumps. We get goose bumps. You get some fluttering thing come by, you go go somebody some resounding word that's going to change the world, and they end up shipwrecked. People need to be careful about messing in people, meddling in people's lives about their boyfriend or girlfriend or lack thereof, and you're going to prophesy somebody together or prophesy somebody apart. Hello. You are not God's Dr. Laura, whatever her name is. You're going to go around and prophesy everybody together. Or if you don't like them, you prophesy them apart. It's not prophecy anyway. 
They are led by the Spirit of God of the sons of God. Not by so-and-so's words. Does God, yeah, I believe God uses words. I know I've had prophecies given to me. But if you go back and look at them, God was already dealing with you about that. It was just a, confirm, it's a confirmation of what's already in your heart. I've seen Brother Hagin, everybody thought Brother Hagin the prophet. I've seen him stand and say, now, so-and-so, now, I could be wrong. And you tell me if I'm wrong. But I believe the Lord showed me this. And those that say, no, no, Dad, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You, yeah, the Lord's dealing with me about that. Been dealing with me about that. We've got to be, we gotta be uh, if we're going to flow in the anointing and be trusted with the anointing, we've got to be willing to say I was wrong about stuff when we miss it. Now, I'm going to be honest. I'm, can, I, can I just be open? When I was at Ramah, you know, and listen, sometimes we get to Ramah and we're, we're Y cubed times D cubed. What's that? Triple disaster. All right? And there was, a, there was this girl, and she was dating this guy, and, and I thought, ah, you know, me and my roommates, we thought we just knew everything about God. We wrote a letter back to our home church. Calligraphy pen on parts of paper. We burned the edges of it to the church in Greenville from the church in Tulsa. Greetings, my brethren. Now, it was my other two roommates who did all the writing. I just kind of got in on it like, yeah, that's cool. Let's do that. Let's add this. What are you whispering? Oh, y'all did it as a joke. Yeah, because, because I had done that. Oh, we thought we were spiritual gurus. We were spiritual dum-dums. So I, I, I got a word for you. The Lord showed me this, Lord showed me that. She, she actually just looked the girl at me and said, none of that bears witness with me. Then I tried to argue my position. Well, I know it's God. Well, she said, I'm sorry, I can't receive it because I don't, I don't. You know, and, and, I, and I, about two days later, I, I, I called him back and said, you know what? You're right. Thank you. I need, I need, I need to be straightened out. And God's correcting me in that area. And I don't ever do that anymore. If it's the Lord, it's the Lord. I don't, I don't make sure, I don't get, ooh, I got a feeling that this is wrong. Well, the Lord said. We need to be careful about how we throw around the Lord said. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I want to get into this last part tonight, the spirit of wisdom and counsel and the spirit of power and might. It won't be real long, but I want to get into it tonight because the, the Holy Ghost coming on us does different things. And I know what we've done a lot of spending our time on is making sure that, because you've, you've, you've been around the anointing, you've seen the anointing in manifestation. One way to judge it and make sure that we stay within the parameters of the anointing and not get out doing stuff that the anointing's not involved in. Yeah. Like marrying people who shouldn't be married. Yeah. Yeah. We had a couple in the church when we first came to Greensboro that, they, that we found out later they had been prophesied together. They're divorced. They never got along. Fall all the time. Hello. Cause trouble. Some lady in church who everybody thought was a prophetess. The smoking prophetess. That smoke coming out of her wasn't fire from the Holy Ghost. It was her Marlboros. Yeah, had a voice like that too. But she prophesied to them that, you know, they, they were supposed to get married. They got married because she prophesied it to them. Don't ever. They got married because she prophesied to them. I've been witness to that numerous times and never seen one work out yet. And I don't mean, don't say they haven't. I've just never seen one. Well, you know, so-and-so told us we were supposed to get married and they got married. Now, I don't pray for it to fail, but I can tell you what, I can write down and tell you, it's going to fail. It's kind of like that movie, some movie they had out there, please don't say, um, please don't sing If at your wedding or whatever, by Bread. The old song, If by Bread. Remember, they were old, soft rock group, Bread. If you sing If at your wedding, it's, it's guaranteed to fail. You know, it's within a certain number of days or whatever. She so had it down to science. Well, I, don't, I think we sang at our wedding, we've been going for 33 years, so you can't use that either, but... 
we can't go by what somebody's telling us to do. We need to be able to judge things. And, and this is important because <clears throat> if we're going to know the true manifestation of the Spirit, we've got to be able to discern the yo-yos, the Looney Tunes stuff. What's not God? Hello? The YDs, Young and Dumbs. Now, thank God, if you, you know, if you get Young and Dumbs and put them off the side and straighten them out, you can, get them, you can help them most of the time if they'll listen. Sometimes they won't listen. I listened. Sometimes it's just zeal gone, astray, gone away. And if somebody will take you aside and say, listen, this isn't God. And to show you it's not God, uh, you, can sal you can salvage them. And be, they could be using God because they got a heart and a zeal for God. You want them to use the things of God. But you don't want them to get all mixed up in stuff that's not God. Oh, who? And here's the usual thing. All them old people, they don't know anything. They're all stiff and dried up. They don't know anything about God anymore. I believe they tried that on Jeremiah. Bear lunch is what they were. Came out and started mocking the prophet because he was old. And the bear came out and ate him. One more statement in passing as we get ready to quit. Young people, old people got wisdom. And they've learned a few things in life. They know some things about the Holy Ghost you, you haven't even discovered yet. I was sitting there watching in the room with T.M. Ward, him talking to us, about 15 ministers, telling us how they or used to ordain the assemblies of God. They bring you into a room, and all, all these elders were sitting around, old, old men, sitting around in a circle. They brought you and set you in a chair in the middle, and they didn't, they didn't say, what do you believe? You already put that in your, in your, in your application. Didn't say how long you've been saved. Didn't say what experience have you had. Hello? Didn't say how much money can you bring to the denomination. They just sat there. And just sat there. And finally somebody said, Brother Ward, what were they, what were they, what were they doing? He said, they were discerning us. Because everything you put down on paper and all the recommendations you get from people can be manipulated. All be somebody's opinion, somebody not want to say something bad against you. But they were waiting for the Holy Ghost to tell them there's something reason they shouldn't be ordained. So they just sat there and discerned them. Wow. A little bit different than we do it today, isn't it? You graduate from where? This year? Oh, okay. Now I know, you know, I'm not saying that's really wrong, wrong, but somehow or another, the, the idea of people sensitive enough to the Holy Ghost to put somebody's entire, what they believe is their calling, on the plate in front of them for them to discern them or not, there's something about that that, that makes me think, are we missing something in the church today? And that's the lack of discerning the manifestation of the anointing of God. Because somebody can come here today and do something that's supernatural, and everybody go, oh, that's God. And sometimes it wasn't God at all. They were manipulated by a wrong spirit. So we want to recognize the anointing. We want to judge it by, is it the gospel to the poor? Is it binding up the brokenhearted? Is it delivering the captives? Is it preaching the acceptable year of the Lord? Or is it making them money and making them famous? Everybody said, whoa. And now we're going to talk about the spirit of wisdom and counsel. Because there's some things there we're, not, we're just not tapping into anymore. Honestly. We're not tapping into some things. We're not, we're not connecting with the Holy Ghost in ways we should have been connecting with him. And there's, there's reasons for it. And the biggest part of it is just lazy. We want somebody else to do it for us. Say, oh me, oh my, or help me, Jesus. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 
2417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.